Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, we're delighted and thankful uh, to be invited to this webinar. Um, my name is Josie Oberg. I currently work at M Health Fairview as a manager in the quality and education department. Um, and previously, I, I was at Hennepin Healthcare Systems, uh, where I spent 13 years as a coding and documentation educator for providers and coders. Um, and then I ended my career there as a uh, a leader for our um, education department. Um, and then uh, now I'm at health or uh, Fairview, sorry, um, M Health uh, Fairview that also includes our uh, University of Minnesota physicians. Uh, both these organizations are um, large teaching facility, facilities, as you probably know. Um, also presenting with me today is Christy McCarthy. Christy McCarthy has a master's in informatics. Um, she has 20 plus years uh, running a dental clinic. Um, she uh, worked at Hennepin Healthcare Systems as a provider um, coding and documentation educator as well. Um, and then recently she started a career at M Health Fairview as a revenue integrity analyst. Um, sorry guys, this slide is touchy. <laughs> um, so we've spent, um, we've both spent our careers in revenue cycle, which is very multifaceted <laughs> in the healthcare facility. There's several, several pieces and parts to it, um, and it can get rather complicated. Um, we're happy to be able to help shed some light as providers have a big part in making sure documentation and charges are billed correctly to our patients. So today, um, we have two objectives. Uh, uh, we want you to be able to describe the proper application of the 2021 outpatient evaluation and management guidelines. Um, and then number two, to be able to understand the sleep medicine commonly billed procedures, including sleep studies. For our agenda, um, I'm briefly going to go over the evaluation and management historical background, the scope and implementations. Uh, we'll look at the outpatient guidelines for evaluation management services. So you'll see the ENM throughout the slides, um, which stands for evaluation and management, um, something that you'll get used to once you start um, billing for your services if you haven't already. Um, and then we'll talk about telehealth services. Um, these services have uh, been implemented quickly since the public health department uh, emergency uh, began. Um, Providers are heavily using telehealth services and coding. Um, there have been relaxed, relaxed guidelines during the public health emergency. Um, and, you know, we don't see them going away anytime soon. Um, guidelines might change a little bit and some of those relaxed guidelines might be lifted, but we do feel they'll be around um, and you're probably used to using them already. Um, so, uh, we'll go through some of those uh, codes and uh, guidelines as well, and then we'll talk about sleep studies and tests. Uh, we'll look at some frequently asked questions, and then uh, lastly, our resources. So a little bit about the timeline. Uh, evaluation and management first appeared in CPT in 1992 for both inpatient and the outpatient setting. Uh, the AMA published guidelines in the CPT book, so current procedural terminology book, often referred to as the 1995 guidelines. Uh, CMS uh, then published the guidelines referred to as the 1997 guidelines for a single organ system exam. Um, it just didn't make sense for some groups to code based off of these 1995 guidelines that were focused on a uh, combination of uh, body areas and organ systems. So for groups that really focus on a single organ system, such as psychiatry, ophthalmology, and so forth, they have the option, they've had the option to use either the 1995 guidelines or the 1997, uh, whichever gets them to a, uh, or whichever ones are more advantageous for the provider. Um, these guidelines are still used in the inpatient setting the emergency medicine department setting and, um, you know, for observation services. So uh, for, our 20, or for our outpatient evaluation management guidelines, um, January 1st, 2021, um, 
the AME and CMS have achieved the first overhaul of the evaluation and management of visit documentation and coding in over 25 years. Um, they do anticipate that uh, emergency department inpatient and observation guidelines are expected to change in 2023. So we're expecting a huge change next year um, for our inpatient and emergency department areas as well. So why the big change? Uh, really our technology has developed faster than our guidelines. Uh, the documentation ha has been a huge burden for providers and it's been a longstanding complaint. Uh, the amount of documentation that providers need to be able to code their services. Um, it kind of can get away from patient care um, and what is really needed in the note for um, providers and medical necessity. Um, so what they did is they removed the history and exam scoring, um, meaning a certain number of elements no longer have to be met, and you can document these as medically necessary or appropriate. Um, so you get to decide what, what's medically necessary and appropriate. Uh, you don't have to worry about um, getting those elements of the history and exam for uh, your evaluation and management levels of service. Um, this will give uh, providers more time with patients and less time on coding. And uh, it's CMS's uh, initiative of patients over paperwork. Um, they also um, created some more clear guidelines and definitions, um, which have previously been left up for interpretation. So a lot of gray areas in coding and um, different ways that depending on who looked at them could interpret a guideline very different. So they made very clear definitions to outline, um, you know, what some of the um, components of the medical decision-making are, are in our um, medical decision-making grid. And so we'll look at that in a little bit on, a, on, on some slides coming up. So summary of evaluation and management revisions. Um, so again, as of January 1st, 2021, uh, the E&M levels of service are now determined based on the medical decision-making or the total time on the date of the encounter. History and physical exam are no longer used to score the billing and coding. Um, they've added social determinants of health in our risk category. Um, as part of the medical decision making, as we know that social determinants of health can impact the patient's um, outcome and treatment. Um, they deleted our level one um, for new patients and level one for established patient was kept um, mo mostly just to be used for nurses um, for our freestanding clinics, um, but not for provider use. So level two through five, there's four levels. And, and the idea was to, you know, have less levels to kind of simplify um, the code selection. Uh, they added a prolonged time code, 99417. Um, so previously there, there was a prolonged time code for outpatient services that was an additional 60 minutes. This new prolonged time code is for additional 15 minutes. And it can, it's an add-on code, so it has to be coded with a, a primary level of service. And then it is added when uh, we when providers spend an additional 15 minutes, it can be billed multiple times times, uh, depending on the amount of time spent that day. Here's our uh, medical decision-making grid. Maybe you guys have seen this already. Um, our 95 and 97 guidelines, it was a grid of the history exam and medical decision-making. So now the grid just focuses on the medical decision-making. You can see again, there's the four levels, the level one, uh, there's really no data in it um, because it's not applicable. Um, if you look at that first category, um, we have our different levels of straightforward, low, moderate, or high. Um, and you can see that the level of medical decision making is determined based on two out of three of the elements of the medical decision making. Therefore, you have to meet in two areas to meet a level. So if you're going to code a level five, you have to either have a high uh, in the number of complexity of problems addressed, and maybe you're at a, 
at the high uh, area of the risk, but maybe you're at a moderate in the middle section at the data, um, because you've met two out of three, um, we would assign that code. Um, if we look at the first category, number of complexity of problems addressed uh, is now focused on complexity um, versus uh, number of diagnoses and treatment options on the 95-97 guidelines. Um, so uh, there's no longer workup in our number of complexity of problems addressed. This used to be a, a deciding factor on whether um, we could code a higher um, level of service. And so that workup is no longer considered. It's really focused more on the complexity of the diagnoses rather than uh, the amount of diagnoses and whether workup was performed. Uh, again, there's the key definitions. So if we look at uh, stable chronic illness, um, there's a definition for stable chronic illness. And for um, all the different uh, diagnoses you see there, there will be a definition. Um, so for, for stable chronic illness, um, this is going to be a patient that has not, uh, their, um, patient who is not at their treatment goal. Um, so for purposes of defining chronicity, conditions are treated as chronic, whether or not stage or severity. Examples would be uncontrolled diabetes and uh, controlled diabetes are a single chronic condition. So again, um, you know, they're not stable if um, they're not at their treatment goal. So they would have to be at their treatment goal to be considered stable. And so sometimes that's um, been an area of you know, difficulty for um, coders and sometimes providers knowing where that would fall into this category. And so the clear definition really helps um, you know, us know which area to, to code these um, different um, di diagnoses. So if we look at the second category, we have our amount and our complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed. If you look at that top box, and I apologize, it's kind of small. It's hard to get this huge grid on one slide, um, but you'll see an asterisk for each unique test order or document contributes to the combination of two or combination of three in category one below. So the, there's three different categories in the mountain or complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed. You can see uh, there's a limited, moderate, extensive level, or there's just the straightforward, which is minimal or none uh, data reviewed or analyzed. Um, there, the three categories are number and complexity of problems addressed. Um, sorry. <laughs> the, 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 the first category is, sorry, any combination of two uh, um, of the following. So um, you need uh, either two of the tests ordered or reviewed um, for a low, um, and then you, for moderate, you would need any combination of three from the following. So uh, you would have to have either three reviews of labs, independent, maybe you have a combination, you ordered a test, you reviewed uh, two separate tests that would kind of bump you up into that moderate, um, or um, you, in, you did an uh, independent interpretation of a test. And um, the only time this wouldn't count is if it's something that you're separately billing. So if you're doing an interpretation for a sleep study, for example, uh, we wouldn't be able to count that in that category. Um, they consider that double dipping because we're billing for it. Um, so you might be focusing more on that first category. And then uh, the third category there is discussion of management uh, um, or test interpretation. So that's going to be with an external physician um, or other health healthcare professional. Um, or appropriate source. So it could be you're discussing um, with the radiologist the results of the imaging. Um, that's going to get you um, that category there. So the more um, combination and categories you meet, you get up to that higher level. So for that level five, um, you have to have two categories um, out of the three to meet that extensive level 
the nice thing about this that changed was uh, on the 95 guidelines, 97 guidelines, if you ordered, uh, say, multiple labs, it didn't matter. You could only count it once. Um, so now they're saying each unique test uh, providers get credit for is that's additional work that the provider's doing and considering in their uh, medical decision making. So this was a, a huge win for providers to be able to count all the extra work that they do in their medical decision making. Lastly, we have, and that's it. So lastly, we have our risk of complications and or morbidity or mortality of patient management. So, um, you know, you can see there's examples in moderate and high. Um, these are just examples. They're not an exhaustive list. This is probably the hardest area for coders providers to really know where it falls. This is where providers really need to document their thought process when you're considering um, differential diagnoses. Um, there's uh, comorbidities that are increasing the risk. Um, this is really where you know, the documentation needs to support that medical decision-making level. Um, when we meet that high, for example, um, sometimes there really is that documentation that's lacking to support that high. And um, just that documenting that thought process in that medical decision-making can really increase that level of service, along with, um, you know, having, an ex having a specific uh, diagnosis code. So being extremely specific about your uh, getting down to the specificity of your diagnosis codes um, to support uh, the severity. So if we look at the time summary of changes, um, so counseling and coordination of care was a deciding factor of whether we could bill based on time in the 95-97 guidelines. This is no longer a requirement um, unless you're <laughs> working inpatient um, or emergency medicine. This is no longer a requirement. It's total time. So uh, total time, we can count we can uh, code based on time. Uh, it's non face to face time and it's also going to be face to face time. So any time spent that calendar day um, regarding uh, the patient. Um, the question does come up a lot whether, you know, if a provider is pre charting the previous day, um, can they count that time? We know providers might have administrative time on a different day and that's when they do a lot of their, their prep. Um, and unfortunately, CMS is very clear. Um, that we can only count the time on the day of the visit. Um, they did um, state that they valued the code, knowing that, um, some, that some of that work is done outside of that calendar day. And so they, they, val they increased the values of the code, so, um, which is called the work RVU, so relative unit value. Um, they increased these relative val value units to um, support some of that um, work that's done on a different day. Um, and then it's, when we're billing based on time, it does not include time and activities normally performed by clinical staff. So that would be like vit vitals, recording, history. It's going to be that total time spent by the physician or other healthcare provider. So here's our time thresholds. Um, so there's a, there's a time range now. There used to be just a, a, um, a time, just a estimated time of what the uh, level would be. Um, now there's a time range. And so um, times have changed a little bit. So if you've seen the older um, times associated with these codes, make sure you have updated times. Um, and then again, the level one is, you know, used only for standalone clinics so that um, you can disregard that code, um, but it's still uh, an active code. Uh, for the prolonged add-on codes, uh, 99417 is the CPT code, and then Medicare has their own code, G2212. Um, in our facilities, usually um, when we have to build a uh, Medicare, um, we just create a system rule that uh, does this on the back end that changes the, the code from a 99417 to the G code. So depending on where you work, um, it's either uh, done by the coder or it's also gonna be um, 
possibly a system rule if 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 uh, the electronic health record um, supports such a thing. So with this add-on code, uh, providers have to meet the highest threshold. So the only time it can be used is with that level five. And when there's additional 15 minutes, so anything under than 15 minutes, we cannot count the add-on codes. And so here's an example of uh, total time required for reporting. So you can see if it's 60 to 74 minutes for that level five, we wouldn't be able to build that add-on code. Um, we can start building that add-on code uh, once we get to that 89 to 103 minutes for that new patient level five and so on. Here are some of the elements that are included in that total time. So preparing to see the patient, um, again, so as long as it happens on the same calendar day, uh, maybe you're uh, documenting the note uh, that on that day, that time counts, uh, counseling, educating the patient, caregivers, doing coordination of care, ordering tests, all those are elements. So anything really related to that patient that day that you're um, uh, performing face to face or with a, or without the patient present, you can count towards your total time. Elements not included for time would be anything that, like we talked about, that's separately billable, so minor procedures, um, EKGs, and other office diagnostics. Uh, those are going to be often separately billable unless you're not billing them. Um, and then explaining risk and benefits and obtaining informed consent for surgical procedures. Um, so any, that's typically included in the procedure time. And then uh, time spent teaching or resident fellow time. So we cannot count resident or fellow time, um, only staff time. We would just code off the elements then. So here's an example of a low medical decision making. We'll talk a little bit um, about this uh, visit and why it's a low, which is a level three um, established, uh, the low. Um, but then we'll also talk about some components that some components that could possibly increase uh, the level as well. So here we have a patient um, that initially presented. Um, there, with a lot of noxious snoring. Uh, this is a follow-up visit. Um, the patient has moderate to severe sleep apnea. Um, the snoring disrupted the sleep of his bed partner. He was found to have moderate to severe sleep apnea, was treated with nasal CPAP at 10 centimeters HTO, H2O nasal pressure. Um, he had been on CPAP now for several months and returns for follow-up review. Um, of his response to treatment. The patient reports that the CPAP reduced to snoring at night. The patient estimates that he uses the CPAP approximately five to seven nights per week and on occasion takes it off um, in the middle of the night. The patient's sleep pattern consists of going to bed at 11 and 11.30 at night and awakening between six to 7 a.m. on weekdays. Um, he might sleep until eight or nine on Saturday, Sunday, and he might go to bed approximately midnight. As noted, the patient is not snoring on CPAP. He denies much tossing and turning and does not awaken with the sheets in disarray. He's, he awakens feeling relatively refreshed. The patient reports no change in daytime stamina. He has no difficulty staying awake during the day or evening hours. Um, the provider takes some medical history. Um, also, a little uh, exam uh, for the patient. You can see the patient's overweight. Um, there's no labs or other tests in this uh, medical decision making. Uh, so for the assessment, assessment and plan, uh, we have a diagnosis of moderate to severe sleep apnea. The provider recommended the patient continue uh, CPAP indefinitely. He'll be sending uh, the provider his smart card for downloading to determine his CPAP usage pattern. Um, in addition, he will continue efforts to maintain his weight at current levels or below. Should he succeed in furthering, the uh, provider might consider rerunning a sleep study to determine whether he still requires a CPAP. 
Um, in the meantime, if it is also that the possible nasal obstruction is contributing to snoring and obstructive hyponia, uh, the provider is recommended and placed an order for fiber optic ENT exam. This is to include um, adenoidal tissue that um, may be contributing to the obstruction and he'll be returning for routine follow-up in six months. So if we look at our medical decision-making grid, um, so in that first category, uh, number and complexity of problems addressed, we have one stable chronic illness. Uh, we have limited snoring on CPAP, patient awakens feeling rel relatively refreshed. The patient reports no change in daytime stamina. He has no difficulty awake during the daytime or even evening hours. So he's really at his treatment goal. Uh, we have a mountain and or complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed. Um, you know, there's really, we're at a minimal or none. Um, the ENT exam could be, uh, is one element, um, but it does not meet the um, higher than the straightforward since it's uh, minimal or none. You have to have uh, two tests or do, uh, and documents in order to meet that limited. And then uh, he forgot to bring in his smart card, so we were unable to count that. Um, risk of complications and or morbidity or mortality of patient management, uh, low risk of morbidity from additional diagnostic testing or treatment. Um, so this would be a low, low risk um, based on the consequences of the problem addressed at the encounter when properly treated. Um, again, he has reduced that snoring. He's improving no changes in treatment plan. Um, this is a routine follow-up. So you know, some things to consider, um, possibly billing based on time for a patient like that. So a level three established visit is 20 to 29 minutes. Um, you know, therefore, if you're really spending much more time than that, billing based on time uh, might be more advantageous. Um, sometimes billing based on the ele elements uh, of the medical decision making are going to be more advantageous. So, um, as you get to get familiar with, with the coding guidelines, um, you, you really would code based on whichever is more advantageous to the provider, um, whether it's that time or the elements. Sometimes when we get into those high levels and we're not spending that uh, enormous amount of time, but we're meeting that high level, we would code based off of the elements of the medical decision-making or vice versa. So social determinants of health. Um, so we talked about that a, a little bit. Um, this is a new element that's added to the table of risk um, in that moderate section. So while this is something that was noted and documented um, prior to the guidelines, it's now counted towards your medical decision-making as it can really impact uh, treatment options. So um, some examples could be your patient is unable to make all of his CPAP follow-up appointments due to lack of stability to secure, secure regular transportation. Uh, another might be a patient who is obese and does not have the resources to be able to, to get um, more nutritional food um, as it is more expensive. And so this really significantly impacts the patient's health, health and um, treatment. Uh, this would definitely need to be something that's uh, documented in the patient chart to support the social determinants of health. Um, and uh, the code would also need to be coded. So diagnosis code categories Z55 through Z65 are the codes that we would use for social determinants of health. And so it would be listed in addition to the primary diagnoses. Um, I do know with our first year of coding our um, 2021 guidelines that CMS has noted a low number of social determinants of health on um, claims. So definitely something to consider. It's, it's, a, it's a new um, option to make sure that we're including it in our levels and, um, and it's possibly able to support that higher level of service. <laughs> 
Uh, risk adjustment coding. Um, so additionally, healthcare facilities are moving towards risk adjustment coding, uh, common, commonly referred to as hierarchical condition category coding. So HCC, you'll hear this term a lot. Um, this model identifies individuals with serious or chronic illness and assigns a risk factor score to the, to the person based upon a combination of the individual's health conditions and demographic details. To qualify, these con chronic conditions have to be on a claim once per calendar year. Um, documentation must um, meet one of the four requirements. So if we look at the MEAT acronym, M-E-A-T, um, it's going to stand for monitor, evaluate, assess, or treat. So you have to meet one of those elements, one of those four elements, uh, and support it in the documentation to code it on a claim. It could be something as easy as, you know, you're touching base on one of these chronic illnesses that, you know, the patient doesn't get in um, for a while and they haven't touched base with their primary care provider about their, their um you know, diabetes, um, that's an area, you know, you're addressing it and making sure that they follow up with their um, primary care provider. Um, and then there's 79 conditions and more than 9,000 diagnoses um, codes that risk adjust. So risk adjustment uh, codes, they, they get signed what's called a RAF score. Um, and it's a risk adjustment um, factor is what that's called. So um, the higher the RAF score, the higher the re reimbursement. So the higher the severity of the condition, the higher the reimbursement. Um, for example, diabetes without complication has a RAF score of 0 0.105. Diabetes with chronic complications has a, a RAF score of 0 0.302. Um, sometimes we see, you know, unspecified documentation or just that lack of specificity. Um, those unspecified codes often don't lead to a risk adjustment code and it can really significantly impact the reimbursement. So just uh, the key takeaway is making sure that you're, uh, you know, getting down to the specificity of your diagnosis codes. Billing based on time example. Um, so here we have a, a patient that um, it's actually an initial visit. Um, we have some HPI elements there. Um, and then if we, we have a patient with insomnia unspecified. Uh, so again, that's something if we can get to that specificity, um, we definitely want to do that. Um, this is a, an encounter with a the provider spent uh, 65 minutes total time. Um, this is some. This is what your time statement would look like. Uh, total time spent on this encounter, including pre-visit review of separately obtained history, face-to-face -face interaction, uh, performing medically appropriate physical exam, patients counseling, education, ordering tests, care coordination, documentation was 65 minutes. This is going to meet that high level. Um, you know, we know we do know there's a lot of counseling and um, discussion of diagnostic tests uh, with sleep medicine, especially on those follow up visits. Um, you know, so it just might be more advantageous that we're billing based on time because there's really a lot more counseling um, that's taking place. Um, and so, you know, time is is probably pretty commonly used within this uh, sleep medicine specialty. So again, um, the diagnosis codes are important and sometimes misunderstood aspect of the co of correct coding. So they're the key element in all claims that support medical medical necessity and reflect uh, severity. Um, so when there's improper ICD-10 diagnostic coding, um, this can lead to claim denials and other missed revenue opportunities. It can also make the practice a target for audit audits and expose it to risk. So um, making sure that we have that documentation is extremely important. Payers are definitely starting to deny um, more claims that are listed as unspecified diagnoses and um, looking for that more um, specific diagnoses. Of course, if there isn't one, then it's appropriate to diagnose the unspecified, but 
when there is uh, more specified diagnosis codes, we want to make sure to uh, code those. So some additional services that we can bill um, for um, sleep providers or that we often see is billing um, psychotherapy in addition to the evaluation and management. So um, when providers are, um, you know, they're doing some cognitive therapy for insomnia or patients with insomnia um, and they're meeting that time threshold to report that additional code, um, we can bill for the evaluation and management code and a psychotherapy code. Um, there's codes that are psychotherapy that are to be billed with ENMs, and then there's individual psychotherapy codes. So we would choose the, the psychotherapy code to be reported with the ENM. And then uh, the time for the psychotherapy has to be documented. It's best practice to document that start and stop time. And then when we're billing psychotherapy with an evaluation and management code, we cannot bill that evaluation and management code on uh, time. We have to code based on that medical decision making. Um, here we have history exam and medical decision making. So it depends on um, which setting you're in. If you're in the outpatient setting or in the inpatient setting, uh, we would bill based on that uh, medical decision making for um, the outpatient setting. Um, and it is possible to have the same diagnoses um, if, if you're reporting both the ENM and the psychotherapy code. Um, and then we would append a modifier 25, uh, which stands for significantly separately identifiable evaluation and management um, service on the date of the evaluation uh, ENM encounter. So um, this would go on the ENM, and it's really just for an, an informational modifier to notify um, payers that um, yes, we perform two services. Yes, it's medically appropriate. Another one uh, is smoking cessation. This can be billed in addition to evaluation management codes. CMS provides coverage of smoking and tobacco use cessation counseling services for patients who use tobacco, regardless of whether they have symptoms or signs of tobacco-related disease. Um, CMS will also cover two cessation attempts per year. Each attempt may include uh, a maximum of four intermediate or intensive counseling sessions. It will cover up to eight smoking cessation counseling sessions in a 12-month period. Documentation must include um, or may include assessment of readiness and barriers for a change, cessation techniques, resources, and follow-up. And these are time-based codes. So you can see there's uh, a code for um, greater than uh, 10 minutes um, is the higher code, and then three to 10 minutes is the lower code. Um, so if time's not documented, we would not be able to code these. These would be listed again in addition to the um, evaluation and management office visit code um, with that 25 modifier. Um, and only face-to-face -face time is counted towards the smoking cessation as it's a counseling code. And now I'm gonna hand the, the presentation off to Christy McCarthy to talk about uh, the different types of telemedicine and our sleep studies. Thank you, Thank Josie. You. Before I get into the telemedicine, I've noticed that there have been some really great questions coming through in the chat. Um, I have not been able to get to all of those questions. So my hope is that we'll have some time after the presentation where we can address those and Josie can also work on um, addressing some of them as well. So I, I don't want anyone to think that we are ignoring your question. We will hopefully get to all of them. So telemedicine, they have become a prominent modality for provider care during the public health emergency. There are different types of telemedicine services such as video visits, um, which are real-time audio visual, telephone encounters, uh, virtual check-ins, and then online digital evaluation and management uh, encounters as well. Uh, one common guideline amongst all of the telemedicine encounters uh, 
uh, for new and or established patients are that all of these encounters must be patient initiated. Next slide. So first we'll start off with audio video visits um, and audio visits have some specific audio video visits, excuse me, have some specific rules. Uh, the visit must be conducted with real time audio and video. Uh, all telemedicine services must be reported with the 95 just to indicate that the service uh, was performed via telemedicine modalities. And for the professional component, these visits are considered the same as in-person visits and are paid at the same rate as regular inpatient visits. Um, the telemedicine video visits should be reported in the place of service that would have been reported had you seen the patient in the office. So exact example of if you would have seen your patient in the office, that would be the place of service that you would report for the uh, telemedicine encounter. For telemedicine services, all documentation should include the requirements of your normal documentation. So your diagnosis, your active diagnosis, your risks and benefits of treatment, compliance, coordination of care with other providers, and providers should remember to always use the ENM code that best describes the nature of care and service that you are performing regarding of the physical location of the patient and or the provider. Some additional documentation requirements for telemedicine. Um, you should also include a start and stop time. You should document that the visit occurred via telemedicine, that the patient had consented to the visit modality, and the physical location of the patient. Uh, the names of all persons participating in the telemedicine service and their role in the encounter should also be documented. Next slide. So I thought I would, we would include some audio video examples because as we all know, technology is wonderful until it isn't. And um, I am sure everyone has experienced a disruption in their audio video uh, telemedicine encounter. So we have included some examples of what could be billed in certain scenarios. So if a patient has a telemedicine video visit scheduled and the provider establishes video audio connection with the patient, the visit is conducted and the provider selects their charge by choosing the appropriate ENM code based on the documentation. This would be considered a video visit evaluation management service, just as if the patient were in the office and it supports billing either the new patient ENM codes 99202 through 99205 and the established patient codes of 99212 through 99215. If a patient has a scheduled video visit and the provider attempts to connect audio video with a patient and the connection is not successful, the provider would then ask if they would like to continue that visit using audio only. So they're not able to connect um, via audio video. So they're only able to do an audio. The appropriate charge for that would be a telephone evaluation and management service. And that would support billing um, the following codes. Uh, physician or APP would be 99441 through 99443 and non-physician 98966 through 98968. And these telephone ENM codes are time-based codes. Next slide. So another scenario is a patient has scheduled a video visit, the provider establishes video audio connection with the patient. And while conducting the visit, the connection is disrupted. The provider may attempt to reconnect and ask if they would like to continue the visit using audio only. So the important part of this is that audio and video were established. So part of the visit was able to be um, conducted. So this could be based on documentation, a telemedicine telehealth video visit that would support the new patient ENM in office codes 99202 through 5 and established patient 99212 
through 99215. And then we have a patient scheduled for video visit. Provider establishes video audio connection with the patient. While conducting the visit, the connection is disrupted. At this, in this example, the, pay, the provider is not able to reconnect with the patient at all. So in this scenario, the provider would select the appropriate charge based on documentation. So it could be different options. It could be an audio video visit. It, you might have gotten you know, three quarters way through your uh, appointment or encounter and your documentation would support uh, a new patient or established patient e &M. or it might be a brief touch base, G2012, or a no charge. And that might look like you were able to connect maybe for five minutes and you were unable to regain connection. Next slide. So virtual telephone visits, these are time-based, as I mentioned before, they are non-face-to-face -face encounters originating from an established patient for evaluation management of a problem by a qualified physician. So in these encounters, providers must document verbal consent from the patient and that it was obtained. Non-physician refers to licensed clinical social workers, uh, clinical psychologists, and physical therapists. And total time is required for billing. And total time includes, which must be documented, is start and stop time, provider to patient interaction, uh, review of medical records and documentation. So again, there are different codes and they are time-based. So you have different codes for a physician or an APP, a non-physician, and then there's a different set of G codes for telephone and virtual check-in. Next slide. So online medical evaluation services are also time-based. These are, again, non-face-to-face -face encounters originating from an established patient to the physician or other qualified healthcare pro professional for an e &M of a problem utilizing my chart. So the difference here is that we are going to have communication through my chart. We don't report these codes if the online patient request is related to an e &M service that occurred within seven days prior to or following the e-visit. And again, one thing to note that some of these guidelines um, have been relaxed during the public health emergency. Um, they are subject to change and payment for these services is also subject to change at any point as well. And again, there are different codes for a physician and EPP, along with separate codes for non-physician. Next slide. So we do have an example of when to visit, bill an e-visit. So a patient initiates an e-visit by completing the online questionnaire. Um, they are inquiring a, a possible urinary tract infection. So the provider then opens up the questionnaire that was sent through the patient my chart, reviews the information filled out along with any past medical history and current medications. Uh, the provider will then assess the condition described, and then he will document a diagnosis and create a treatment plan. And in this scenario, it would include a prescription for an antibiotic. So this is an evaluative online visit, and it does support billing the applicable e-visit code, uh, either 99421 uh, through 99423, as this provider would be either an MD or an APP. Next slide. So we wanted to also include some of the frequently used sleep medicine codes um, and, it, and also include associated relative work units or the work R RUV, RVU, excuse me. So you can see there are sleep medicine codes that are specific to age. So for example, for children under the age of six, um, sleep studies that are unattended and attended. And then the also sleep studies dependent on how many parameters are included in the test. Next slide. So another thing to consider, our sleep studies have a technique technical component and a professional component. Uh, the technical charge is for the sleep technician performing the sleep study. And then the professional charge is for the interpretation by the reading provider. 
So this would be dependent on the place of service, whether you are in a hospital-based clinic or a standalone clinic, the charges will go out on the claim separately or globally. So globally means technical and professional uh, co would be combined into the one charge. Next slide. So we do have some documentation requirements for these studies. Um, the documentation must show that the polysomnography was performed in a facility-based sleep study laboratory and not in a home or mobile facility. Uh, the sleep disorder clinic must have on file the patient's record, uh, documentation regarding sleep sy systems, and that they are severe enough to interfere with a patient's daily living and well-being. If two or more nights of testing are performed, documentation justifying the medical necessity for the additional tests must be available and documented in the patient's record. For home sleep tests, documentation must show that these tests were performed in conjunction with a comprehensive sleep evaluation and patients with a high pretest probability of moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. The patient who undergoes a home sleep study must receive prior to the test adequate instructions on how to properly apply a portable sleep monitoring device and the instruction must be provided by the provider conducting the test. Documentation must show that the home sleep test was accomplished using a Medicare approved device. And this would include description of channels monitored or clear indications of same included in the test report. And it also is required that it was the test was performed by a physician meeting the training requirements listed in coverage indications, limitations, and or medical necessity section in the Medicare guide. Next slide. So we also wanted to put in some commonly asked questions. Um, what are G codes and what would you use a G code and when would you not use a G code or use a CPT code in, uh, in replace of that? So G codes are typically used to bill for medical care payers. And whereas most private payers will accept the CPT code or use a CPT code, there are some instances where insurers will accept both the G and the CPT codes. So a question um, regarding actigraphy as a standalone service. This is indeed a standalone service. Um, it is not appropriate to bill this with home sleep studies, uh, CPT codes 95800, 95801, 95806 through 811. Next slide. It has been asked who can interpret a home sleep apnea test. You would need to have, because Medicare and private insurance policies, they require board certification in sleep medicine in order to interpret either a polysomnography or a home sleep study test. So again, you would need to be board certified in sleep medicine in order to interpret home sleep study tests as well. Uh, next question, a sleep study is performed on a patient with sus sus suspected OSA. If the study is negative, what diagnosis code should be used? So if you do not establish a diagnosis after a sleep study is performed, you are going to want to document signs and symptoms. And then you can uh, base your diagnosis on the signs and symptoms that prompted the order for the test. And last question is, how should we report a PSG or home sleep study when a full night of data is not received? So in order to bill for those tests, there has to be continuous and simultaneous monitoring and recording of various physiological and pathophysiological parameters of sleep for six or more hours. If that full night of data is not received, you would need to include the reduced services modifier 52. Uh, there are two different scenarios. So in cases of less than six hours recording time in patients ages six and older, and then in cases of less than seven hours recording in patients under the age of six. So there is a different uh, time uh, threshold for this modifier to be used dependent on age. And this is all for our presentation. At this point, I will turn this back to Josie 
to answer any questions that you may have or that popped up on the chat that we were unable to get to. Thanks, Christy. Um, first of all, I think we'll let Sally um, do her poll questions and then we'll jump to questions. Yes. Sound, sounds great. Um, let's see here. I'm just going to pull over the chat box. Um, I'm, I'm just going to take a look here. Christy was able to respond to some of the questions because I was driving. I wasn't really able to look. Otherwise, it was messing up our uh, being able to jump to the next slide. So um, I was hoping to be able to answer some of those questions, um, but wasn't able to get to them. So um, we had a question for pediatrics. Does a parent count in as an independent historian? Uh, Christy responded um, that yes, a parent does count as an independent historian. Um, typically these are gonna be younger patients that really can't uh, speak um, to their signs and symptoms. So it would typically be younger patients rather than um, older patients. Let's see here. And then um, we have, so reviewing results of tests that were ordered by other physicians and have been billed by other physicians, does that count uh, towards your workup? Um, and yes. Um, so if you're reviewing just a test or a lab, um, it's review or order. So we can count both. Um, so, or if it's a, another facility that performed the sleep study, you're not performing it, performing it. So you can count that independent interpretation towards your medical decision making. Um, and you would just want to make sure that it's clear that it's your interpretation and not um, copied from a report. All right. Um, if a review interpreted PFT or interpreted PSG by another physician, yeah, so we got that one. Does it increase um, complexity? Um, again, it would, in that medical decision-making grid, um, which I can go back to. Anything that you do um, towards that medical decision making that is going to be, let's see if I can do this faster, a test or any type of data reviewed, the more data and the more combinations reviewed, it, it could definitely increase that level of service. Get back to that grid so you guys can kind of look at it as we're talking. If a patient had uh, brought their SD card, would it change the billing? Uh, it kind of depends. Um, probably not for that visit um, because uh, if you can look at the example here, um, we have to have two out of the three in order to meet um, because the patient was so stable, um, that low category was probably the appropriate level. Um, but certainly in instances, it can impact the level of service. Um, one of the, just one element there um, that's missing can definitely change the level of service. So if it, it's definitely possible. Does CPAP compliance report discussion with patient meet level uh, four follow-up based on medical decision-making? Um, so typically, um, it kind of depends if the patient's not being compliant <laughs> and um, they're at a higher risk. It's very possible that it's going to meet that level four um, or possible to meet that level four with billing based on time um, because there's a lot of discussion. Um, and I can open it up to Christy or uh, anyone else that has any comments on what I've said so far. I would agree. I, I think that's a situation where if you are having a longer discussion regarding compliance, that it might be uh, more advantageous to build based on time. Um, but however, again, as Josie had mentioned, you know, if the patient is not complying with treatment or has barriers to compliance for treatment, such as when we talked about those social determinants of health, um, I feel like that could bring that to a higher level of service because of the risk of 
patient treatment and management. I see a question here on consultations. Um, so one thing to note about consultations, um, well, that's predominantly what you're doing for a lot of your initial visits. Uh, patients were uh, sent to you um, in consultation. And um, when it comes to coding, our Centers for Medicare and Medicaid um, stopped allowing consultation codes. Um, I want to say in 2008, it's been a, it's been a while. Um, so um, they instruct us to use the new or established office visit codes for outpatient and then the initial hospital care, subsequent hospital care for um, the hospital inpatient codes. Um, what we do at our organization and um, when I worked at Hennepin, we still coded the services as, as the consultation for those payers that do allow it. Um, typically the providers, we always have the providers just choose what they're performing and then the coder changes that on the back end as we don't like to burden providers with payer stuff. Um, but because it is a little bit of a higher reimbursement for some of those prior, private payers, uh, we still code them. Um, so we would use different time thresholds. However, if we're coding the consultations, consultation codes, because they're not recognized anymore by medical Medicare um, or CMS, then um, uh, it's we have to follow the 95-97 guidelines. So um, it, it's been kind of a an issue with the new guidelines and, and it can be difficult from providers that are working outpatient that have to, you know, kind of put their 95-97 hats on um, when coding those services. So some organizations have decided to stop using those um, codes just to reduce that confusion and um, extra work that it takes. Okay. Any comments, questions on that? So is there a threshold on how many patient visits we bill for time? Um, as in, is there an informal percentage that would be frowned upon? So I don't, I don't necessarily think so. Um, these, these codes, this is the first year again that we're um, coding them with these new guidelines. And so um, everybody's getting used to them and um, we'll kind of find out more as time goes on and as Medicare kind of does audits and things like that. Um, but I think the idea is that you're not spending more time than what's in a calendar day or your, your shift, um, for example. So if your times are um, way higher than um, you spend in a day, then that, that's something that's going to be looked at. So just, you know, something to think about. Um, and then for the uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, so what's, what if it was done in a group setting with multiple patients, how does that affect uh, billing? So there are um, group visit codes. It's just uh, the organization just has to be set up for that um, billing and documentation. And so it's typically something that as long as we're set up to be able to bill for group visits, um, we can code those group therapy codes. Do you have anything to add on that, Christy? No, no. Okay. I, okay. That's, that is exactly what I was thinking as well. <laughs> okay. So please include a workshop for next such lecture so we can attempt practice billing for clinic documentation via nets. That's a, that's a great idea for sure. Um, that is definitely helpful. And we'll note that. Uh, and then we have just to confirm this is billing alone now uh, without including exam and history. Yes, um, it does not include the exam and history. So while we still expect to see a history and exam, um, and not just the medical decision making. In a note, the history and exam elements are not counted towards the level of service um, for outpatient or ambulatory um, office visits. And so still counted for those um, inpatient services. Again, I know sleep medicine's a, a group that um, doesn't do as many inpatient, but we also 
have many of our sleep providers that are also neurologists and psychiatrists and pulmonologists. Um, so when working under um, that specialty and working inpatient, we still have those old guidelines. Um, so what CMS says is just a medically appropriate history and exam. Generally, what is level four follow-up on medical decision-making equivalent to in terms of reimbursement when compared to billing um, for time? So for example, 30 minutes or 60 minutes. And we didn't, I don't think we added RVU. So that's something that we can um, send a follow-up uh, communication back with RVU differences. Um, and I'm just trying to see here for billing based on medical decision making, or I'm not 100% following. Um, but there are um, each code, of course, increases in RVU. So um, we would always want to build what's more advantageous um, for the provider. And that's instructions that we, we get from Centers for Medicare and Medicaid um, that providers can choose one or the other and what's more advantageous. So I know that Christy answered a bunch of questions too. Um, are there any that uh, you guys want me to get to that I haven't gotten to or that Christy haven't, hasn't gotten to? Just to open it up. And Sally, um, maybe um, if you could email us the list of questions here, because we'll probably lose access right when we sign off, um, that would be great. So we can kind of scrub through them and make sure that we didn't miss anything um, important. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Sure. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Thanks.